try it, I suppose. Will this work for you? Sure. Okay. You ready? Ready to go. Okay. Hi, it's Jeff Redding, and we're here backstage at Blossom Music Center with somebody that I'm sure most of you will recognize quite readily. Mr. Michael Stanley, welcome to VidMag TV. Nice to be here. Yes. Well, we're going to kind of turn the tables on you a little bit. You're the one who's usually uh, used to doing the features, so now it's time to do one on you. Um, which brings me to the, the first thing I wanted to talk about. Um, first of all, you're no stranger to television. Your first television exposure came some time ago, didn't it? Long, long time ago. I, it, I can't even remember when the first one was. Back, uh, as far as music goes, it was back in the Gene Carroll show. Oh, that was, you didn't tell me about that one. <laughs> Gene Carroll. A band I was in, they used to have, I don't know if they still even have them, they used to have Battles of the Bands a oh, lot yeah, yeah, high they schools do and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And at that point, one of the prizes, if you won, was to get, go on the Gene Carroll show and play a tune, uh -huh. and, uh, which was a very big deal in town at the time. And uh, this band I was in, we won some Battle of the Bands, and that's it, went on there. And, you know. and, and, and this is where the bug bit you, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, the one I was talking more specifically about was your first national exposure, the... Uh, Kirshner. Kirshner. Oh boy, that was. Um, I had a, a solo, my second solo album out on MCA, and uh, the guys that played in the band. It was, it was a great bunch of guys: uh, Joe Walsh, and Joe Vitale, and Kenny Passarelli, who were all with Barnstorm at the time, and uh, Paul Harris and uh, Al Perkins from Manassas, uh, Dan Fogelberg, Richie Fure from Buffalo Springfield and Poco, Sanborn, David Sanborn, Jay Giles. Um, it was just a I'm leaving somebody out. Oh, Joe Lala, he was in uh, Manassas too at the time. And uh, somehow, I don't even remember how it happened, but we got this offer to go on Kirshner. And I was, I was just making the records. I didn't tour, I didn't play any shows. Uh -huh. I mean, and it was like, whoa, uh, David Spiro was managing me at the time. And it was like, we got to do this. It's a great thing. We'll get seen by, you know, X number, 100,000, million people, whatever. And uh, so I happened to call these guys up, and they were all available. Um, this whole everybody? Yeah, all everybody with the exception of uh, Kenny Passarelli. I forget Kenny. So we got a guy named Brian Giroffalo to, to play bass who used to play with James Taylor and things. And we went, to, we all flew to LA and, and rehearsed for one night mm -hmm. and uh, went and did the show. Wow. And it was uh, bizarre to say the least. <laughs> I can I'm still to this day trying to find a, a tape. I have an audio tape, but I don't have a videotape. And somebody recently said that they have come across it. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, if I see it, it would be the first time I've seen it since, like, 1972. Wow, boy, I would love to see that. Yeah. That would have to be, like, really wild. So now, uh, we'll come up to 1987 and uh, your current television exposure. Um, <laughs> initially, PM Magazine, and then, right. of course, it changed over recently to um, Cleveland, yeah, Cleveland Tonight. Um, of the two, which, which do you like better and, and why? those two shows or mm -hmm. of, of music in that? Of, of those two shows. Um, I preferred PM. And uh, this week, actually, Cleveland Tonight has switched back to sort of the PM format. Mm -hmm. The reason I, the reason I uh, preferred PM was because we were, we did all shooting out like you do. Mm -hmm. we, were, uh, we were out and about. We went wherever things were going on. And uh, <clears throat> with Cleveland Tonight, we were locked into the studio, which is OK. Um, and I didn't mind being in the studio, it made my life a little simpler, but at the same time, um, with PM, we traveled a lot, you know, I have the, the list of places in terms of even, I mean, out, out of the country that I went, uh, was fantastic. I mean, I just saw a lot more of the world. I saw most, saw every bit of the United States when I was in the band, and uh, a few other countries, but with PM, I, I saw all sorts of places. So, I'm glad that we're back out in the, uh, in that format where we're someplace different every day. Mm -hmm. Now, Regarding this, the, the TV thing, it's, it's funny because in the scene interview, um, you had mentioned the fact that the reason that you wanted to stop doing the band thing was because you didn't want to be in the spotlight, and then you went and you did this. Well, you, it, yeah, I mean, it sounds really like, it shows you how smart I am, as I said. But when I started, when I went to, from, from the band to PM, I was just doing feature reporting, so I was only on once, maybe twice a week. Uh -huh. And that was okay. I was behind the scenes doing this stuff, and I'd have my little shot once or twice a week. And then all of a sudden, when Tony Harris, who was the guy, the male co-host, um, quit, I was like the only other guy there. And not prepared to do the job whatsoever, I mean, in any way, shape, or form, uh, but got it out of default more than anything. And you seem to have done a pretty good job with it. Well, I was real lucky. I had, I had a lot of good people around me who helped me. 
plus I've always considered myself somebody who I'll sit around and watch how things go mm -hmm. and I can pick up on it if you give me a chance to pick up on something I can do that but it was sort of still was sort of learn as you go kind of and learn in total view of the public mm -hmm. you know I mean I can't look at the, the first stuff I did I just can't look at it yeah well I mean myself too the same way you know? yeah. it's like you get into a groove eventually and then once you do that then you feel comfortable with it but until you do and I mean of course you you've got talent you've been doing this stuff for 20 years and more yeah and I, I didn't mind so being in front of the camera picks up. that was I mean a lot of people that's where they get their stomach block if they can't they look at that camera right there and they, you know they get catatonic or they start you know shaking and things and I've I've never you know minded that uh -huh. I just had to learn the difference between uh, projecting and rock and roll which is basically playing from the back row right bigger than life thing. And in television, the thing I like about it is you can raise your eyebrow and, and everybody will see it. It puts a point across, right. you know, like, oh boy, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. So I like, I, I prefer the subtlety of that, actually. Let's talk about a little slightly different sort of camera, video. Now, you've not got a lot, three. but you got three. Why don't you tell us about them? Um, they were really fun to do. The first one was for uh, <coughs> Kevin Single, He Can't Love You. And, uh, we were, on, we were in the midst of a serious, serious tour. We were out for about four months. And uh, we drove down overnight from San Francisco to LA and shot it in 38 hours straight. I uh, had like five different locations. It's uh, it had a warehouse, it had a, uh, a hospital, it had, uh, I don't know what else it had. But at the time, it was our first one. We didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And somebody had cooked up this idea for the thing. There was some sort of plot to it. And uh, we just had a ball doing it, basically. And when it came out, we were real lucky because it was right when MTV first started, like a month after MTV started. And they were uh, scuffling around for uh, scuffling around for videos, and, you know. And there it was. So it got a lot of play. Well, what was the, what was the <coughs> purpose of doing the video then? If MTV like I don't didn't know. really exist. Good question. <laughs> Very good question. Never thought about that. Just just something like well, now we'll have something like for us to. Well, there were, I think there were a few shows that they were playing things on, like. Uh, Midnight Special, those yeah, things yeah. were still around, and, or they would, you know, send to a local, like, you know, even somebody like a, like a Big Chuck, you know, mm -hmm. and, and Little John might play it or something, but it's a good point. I guess MTV had started, but they were, <coughs> I don't even know if they were in full 24-hour mm -hmm. mode at that point, but we got, we got lucky timing-wise there, and a lot of people know that video, um, although there weren't as many households, obviously, in MTV right. as there are now, but, uh, and then we did, what did we do next? Then we did, uh, one for a song called Take the Time, which we shot at the Paramount Movie Ranch outside Los Angeles. We did it like a cowboy movie. And uh, that was a blast. That was just, I mean, because most of us were the age where we grew up, instead it wasn't all spacemen and you know, Star Wars, it was cowboys. Mm -hmm. We all wanted to be cowboys. And so now we were getting to be cowboys. So you're not know, you know, it was That was fun too. And the last one was my time, which we shot. Uh, and that one, that one got a fair bit of airplay. Right? Yeah, but you can't love you on my time. Did the one in the middle did not whatsoever because MTV said it's a. Uh, they thought it was like a country song. It wasn't a country song. All these guys were wearing cowboy hats. You know? <laughs> they couldn't tell by the music. I know. Like, look, it's not a. You know, come on. It's a little, little uh, you know, it wasn't exactly a thrash. Uh, you know, yeah. But at the same time, it was. Uh, it wasn't Garth Brooks either. So uh, then, yeah, my time did. My time did. So those are the two people. So okay, now now given <coughs> the fact that you've got a couple of videos that people have seen on a fair, fair bit. I mean, and as we know, they never went into heavy rotation like much of them to be flopped. Uh, <laughs> Editorializing. That's what he's doing. Yes. Um, well, I'm sorry. There's too much too much stuff that does get heavy airplay on there doesn't deserve it really, and too much stuff that does deserve it doesn't. And that's that's the one big like complaint. Radio. Yeah, that's the one big complaint that everybody's got with MTV. Uh, but don't ever skate so that. <laughs> but in any case, um, so you've got these couple of videos that, that people are familiar with, fairly familiar with. Why then do you think that the Michael Stanley band never broke much further than Cleveland? Well, see, that's a misconception, basically. Because He Can't Love You was a top uh, 20 single nationally. Uh -huh. uh, My Town was top 30 single nationally. Uh, Heartland Album was on the charts in, in, the top run, in the top 50 for over a year. Um, the, the conception was that we just sort of laid around wherever we were here and came out and played Blossom in the summer and you know, the Coliseum mm -hmm. in the winter. 
when in, in fact we were gone on an average of about seven months a year um, for 12 to 13 years. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we were doing like 150, 200,000 miles a year. Um, I think the thing with us basically was, and the thing goes along with why people aren't totally familiar with this, is, is that we were pretty baseless. We didn't have, we didn't have a real distinct image. Right. And uh, I've found <coughs> that people, people remember the music. You sing He Can't Love You or My Town or Lover or some of the other things. They go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they start singing it. Mm -hmm. They don't have any idea who did it. You know, well, who was that who did that? Yeah. You know, I like that song, but I don't remember this, who it was. And that, I think, was our basic problem. Does that bother you that, that that's the case? Well, I mean, obviously, you got to enjoy the fact that people do recognize the songs. But yeah, that was always the main focus. It wasn't exactly the smartest business thing in the world. Um, I just wasn't willing to... Uh, as, as neither were the other guys, I wasn't willing to cop some serious image mm -hmm. that I didn't feel comfortable with. Right. Because I don't want to. I didn't want to have to like dress up to go to the grocery store, you know. <laughs> right. Um, and I think part of our appeal, the, the people who did get into us besides musically, and especially I think that has to do with our success around here, is that we were just pretty much like, you know, average Joes, mm -hmm. and it could just as easily be you up there, or me, or anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, we just got to be the ones that are there. It's a lot easier. To, in other words, I think if people saw Rod Stewart walking down the street, and I like Rod Stewart a lot, but if they saw Rod Stewart down walking down the street, or Robert Plant, or somebody that's got that image thing, mm -hmm. you know, and the book and the whole thing, it'd be a little standoffish. They might not go up and go, you know, Rod. Uh, you know, they'd be like, ooh, this type of thing. And with us, I don't think that happened. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, in other words, they felt they could come up and talk to us, and they did. And, and it was just, it was just, you know, to. Uh, a terrible phrase, you know, we were just sort of the boys next door. Type right. Thing. Well, I know. I mean, many, many times I've seen you on location for PM or Cleveland Tonight or whatever, you know, and there's always yeah. like when you're not actually on camera, people always coming up to you and saying, I'm like, how you doing? And stuff like that. Which is really, which is really a good thing and, and a very rare thing in this day and age of the, uh, the, the superstar band and all that. You know, yeah. So. I mean, I always found too that the guys that, uh, you know, that I like as a fan. A lot of them were like that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and after touring for, for 15 years and playing with just about everybody in the world at one time or another, you know, you got to see that uh, it was really funny. A lot of people think they have preconceived notions, like, for instance, like, when we were, uh, back in 76, we did a major tour with Ted Nugent. He was at the peak of his dog eat dog and uh, cat scratch fever and all that, right? Mm -hmm. And Ted's just, uh, Ted's just the wild man, right? That's it. I mean, he is. When he hits the stage, he's a wild man. Off stage, he's the nicest person in the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, we just did a feature on Damn Yankees. Recently. Yeah. We actually did a couple of them. And he's, uh, he's, uh, I mean, the, he's real cool. And then other people you meet, you know, like that, uh, supposedly like girls, you know, mellow and cool and nice. You meet them off stage, and they're just jerks. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was, it was a lot of that. You know? I held off with Springsteen for a long time because I really was a fan. I didn't want to find out that the guy was a jerk. Mm -hmm. I, read, I wanted to believe it, that I liked the music and I liked the whole thing. And, 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 and believe in your mind that he's a down-to-earth kind yeah, of guy. Yeah, and, and, and then I, image. I one, a friend of my mutual friend of ours finally said, you, know, you guys got to meet you know, cause, uh, all this. And I finally met him and he was, he was really cool. I mean, he was like I wanted him to be. Mm -hmm. So I walked out of there going, yeah, that's good. Bruce is okay. You know? Yeah, I always heard that about him too, that he really was a decent person in, like, in real life, quote-unquote. Um, let's talk about the records a little bit. Let's start out with uh, the Friends and Legends album, which is something that is getting increasingly hard to find, um, and something that people should really check out, for one thing, because of all those people that you were yeah, talking about. Yeah, it's a good band. Involved. Didn't Klaus Vorman also play on, on, on that? No, no. I, I thought he did, because I, I know you did help on that record. I did, yeah, I did help, and that was, a nice, that was just an idea I had. I was doing a thing at the time with the solo albums, where I was doing one cover tune on every, each of the albums, because first of all, songs I like to do. I did a mm -hmm. Dylan, Dylan song on the first one, and I did this one on the second one. I helped. And I did it really weak. And when you're messing around with Beale songs, you're messing around with, you know, you're like screwing with right. the holy stuff. Right. right. <laughs> People get very worked up about this, you know, like how could you do, it's a sacrilege to do help any other way than they did it. And I did it really slow, and uh, Al Perkins had a steel guitar on it, and uh, I really liked it. But it was really radically different. And then one of the nicest things that ever happened to me was somebody, another mutual friend, played it for John Lennon. And Lennon said, "This is like, you know, what's my favorite version I've heard of this song? This is the way I wrote it. I wrote it. I wrote it slow. We 
sped it up. Wow, that's another thing I didn't know. Really and it was like, that was a, and being a big Lennon fan, um, that was like, you know, a wonderful thing to hear. Uh -huh. so, I, but there's still a lot of Beatle fans who just, you know, they're not going <laughs> to deal with it the way I do it at all. Yeah, well, yeah, I can understand that. I mean, there are those diehard people that just can't take creativity on its own merit, you know, it's like no matter what. And, I mean, I've always, I've never had a complaint with people doing cover tunes and stuff, but when you do a cover tune, it's almost necessary to put some of yourself into it, than oh, to yeah. do it exactly the way it is, you and know? It, and there's more of an insult that way. Yeah, there's certain tunes, too, that um, I don't know why anybody even bothers to cover. If you can't do it, ra if you can't do it for a real different version of it, or a better version of the way they did it, uh -huh. in other words, <coughs> excuse me, um, if you take a, um, I don't know, just for instance, say a Lou Reed song, mm -hmm. and um, I mean, Lou is, Lou is cool, and he writes some great songs, he's, but he's, I mean, let's face it, he's, and he's got this thing about him, but he's not like the world's greatest singer, right. you know, he works for it, but, so somebody could sing that song maybe better, you know, so that you could do it the way Lou does it, do Sweet Jane, a lot of people did Sweet Jane and things like that, and sing it, you know, uh, but at the same time, if you're going to, I mean, why would you cover Yesterday, you know, I mean, or why would you cover, uh, uh, you know, I Am The Wall, or so, mm -hmm. Sympathy For The Devil, or, something like that, where you're not going to do it any better than that. Right, right. And yeah, they're the consummate songs in their, right. in their field. You know, like, I think another one that I covered and I've always done for forever was Carol King's Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow. Tomorrow, wow, yeah. And there's just so many great versions of that song. A lot of people do it, and a lot of people do it differently. So that was just, they, I just love the song, and well, you know, our version that was on stage, that's is pretty uh, over the top. I heard it the other day, I've heard it for years. I love it. I absolutely love and it. It's it one of my like, most favorite songs on the record. <laughs> I was kind of blow your hair back. A yeah, bit. no, I was very surprised when I heard that. It was like it was that it's it's a very moving rendition of the song. And that's another thing I wanted to talk about was the Stage Pass album. There are many people, myself included, who feel that the Stage Pass album is, if not the best Michael Stanley Band album ever, that it's definitely the most powerful album ever, and probably will be the most lasting of them all. It seems to it's it. We, we talked about that a lot, and we still talk about it to this day. Um, and in fact, it's coming out on CD next month. Epic is finally doing that. Um, that. That record, for whatever reason, really struck a chord with a lot of people. It was, a, it was the first turning point for our career. Um, it was our last uh, pitch thing with Epic. But uh, we can listen to it. In fact, we did listen to it a lot when we were getting ready for this show. <laughs> and uh, the thing was, to me, it, it's hard to listen to because it's the sounds, you know, the sonic things of it uh -huh. are so dated. Right, right. Um, the, you can tell, like, primitive. Yeah, yeah and, and the equipment and the certain things had not been developed yet, you know. I mean, you could, and you could also tell if you, if you followed the band and you could tell what new toys we got, like, the week before. You know, <laughs> that but there was something about that record. Of course, at the same time, that was a period when live albums were in vogue, mm -hmm. when Frampton comes alive and all the other, which are the Giles things and all that. Um, Certainly an easy album to make, the easiest. Mm -hmm. We recorded three or four shows at the Agora and took the best version of each tune and put it together. mixed it and put it out. You know? Well, one, one reason that I think might have something to do with that is something that you said yourself about like taking what you do live on stage and converting to what you put on record and blending the two together. And that's exactly what you did. You captured yourself on the record live as you are. And yeah, I think at, nothing that, but. at that point it was pretty representative of what we were doing document that. Plus, we, the other thing we did, which we wanted to do with, when when they said we want you to do a live album, we said, well, you did a live album, we only had two albums, you know? <laughs> Let's do a live album. With, uh, so we took the things, the best things from the solo albums and the two first MSP albums and uh, put them on there along with, I think there were six, five or six brand new songs. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's like, you know, like, uh, as long as I did West Midnight, nothing's going to change my mind and, and things like that. We never did do studio versions of it. That was the only thing any, anybody, there's only ever been a live version of Midwest. Mm -hmm. you know? and I always wanted to do it in a studio because uh, just I thought it could have been, I guess better would be the word, but at the same time, that's the one that everybody's stuck with. So, yeah. Well, it's kind of like an anthem almost. Like, I mean, it's a Midwest anthem. It's well, like, it's the most, it's the most, people think when you're a songwriter that everything you write is about you. Uh -huh. And the luxury you have as a songwriter is to, I can tell, completely tell the truth in the first verse and I can just lie my butt off in the second verse um, because, you know, 
but my story doesn't always make the best story. You know, so you're right. changing around. Right. Midwest is uh, is far and away the most honest song I ever wrote. It's totally 100% honest. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's why it's a little another in joke that nobody, like three people in the world, ever picked up on. Is there's two people listed as writers on that song. Uh, M. Stanley and M. G. And <laughs> that's my real name. Right. So I, put, I gave my I gave my real self credit for writing it with my other <laughs> self. And uh, um, it's funny. I, I, I'm, I'm dating a woman right now who was a little too, uh, she kind of missed the heyday of, she was living somewhere else when we were like huge, so like it didn't mean much to her, it was just nice. Like, okay, you're in a band, big deal. <laughs> and, uh, but the one song she knew was that song. Uh -huh. and it's got like 8,000 words in it. She can, she can recite all the words. I know? think I still can too. I can't sometimes, so <laughs> it's... <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, that is you know that was that was one of my favorite tunes on the on the on the album when I got it. I, like I told you, I bought it down in Florida, and uh, a lot of people like really really enjoyed it. It's like, wow, I never heard these. Yeah. Um, Rosewood Bitters, one of the first songs that you wrote, mm -hmm. um, recently, well, semi recently, uh, covered by Joe Walsh. Yeah, um, there's a there's a great bit. I just somebody just sent me a tape from Howard Stern's radio show. New York, you know how it's doing? It's Madman on the radio. And he had had Walsh on with his acoustic guitar like the day before, and one of the things that Joe did was Rosewood. Well, first of all, Joe played on the original. And from the day we did it, cut it in the studio in 1970, he said, I'm going to cut this song. I'm going to cut this song. Every time I would see Joe for the next 20 years, he would say, I'm going to cut that song. I'm going to cut it. Stop talking about it and cut it. I, it. I, yeah. I need the money. <laughs> cut, cut the song. And finally he did. You know, it was great. But so he, he did this acoustic version of the thing, and they played it the next day on the Howard Stern show. And Howard Stern and his sidekick, this woman, whoever she is, they just start talking about, well, you know, what the hell is a Rosewood Bitter? What's he talking about? You know what? The, and they do like 40 minutes of of New York drive time radio on what is Rosewood Bitters and what is it all about and what does this mean? And they're coming up with these wild interpretations of, of what it means. In fact. Uh, when Joe first cut it and he went on tour and he was playing, he called me from the road one night. He says, Michael, I'm having a lot of trouble. I'm doing all these interviews and people want to know what the hell Rosewood Bitters is. What is it? I said, Joe, you're doing the song now. You make up whatever you, you, make up whatever you want about it. You know? Okay, what is Rosewood Bitters? <laughs> I, it was just two words, basically. The whole concept of the song that uh, is that it has to do with the, to me, the therapeutic value of sad songs. Uh -huh. you know, like if you're really bummed and you play a sad song, and either you empathize with it or you go, oh, that guy's worse than me. I, I feel better now. Um, so Rosewood came from Rosewood, which is using guitars, and bitters was a, a drink which, uh, which sort of uh, indicated that other side of that thing. So it was about playing sad songs on guitar. At the same time, uh, for years it was going around. Just, I would hit this like once a week when we were on the road. Somebody would come up and they would think it was, supposedly it was a drug song. And there was some some form of ganja in Hawaii that was called Rosewood Bitters, and they were and these people bought it because they thought the song was about that, you know. And they said, I've never been to Hawaii. I don't know what's over there. <laughs> Personally, I thought it was I thought it had something to do with a place, maybe a bar or something that had a special drink or something now, like now, that. Now see, now that's the point too. I, I started. I just did something that I shouldn't do. I said I never would, which is basically explain my songs because. Uh, when people started asking me early on, I, I felt really good, like, oh, you want to know about my song? Oh, great, I'll tell you why I created this, uh -huh. or what it meant to me. And you'd explain this, this heartfelt thing that went into it, and they'd look at you and go, jeez, I thought it was totally different from uh -huh. that. And I, I don't like what you just said. I like what I thought about it. Right. Which well, is, I mean, that's you, the way it should be. Yeah, I, I was thinking kind of like it was, you know, because you do a lot of love songs and things, I was maybe thinking that it might have been like a place and a drink that was created or something that somebody would go like when their love fell apart or something like that, you know, be a sad song along that kind of thing. Well, you're in, you're in the right, you're in the same It's still within the same ballpark, you yeah. know, so. But, uh, but that's the good thing about things like that too, where people can come up with different interpretations of things. Um, which actually, in a way, is kind of going to bring me to the next point. As you've probably noticed, I've spoken mostly about the older material, um, which is the stuff I'm most familiar with because that's what I grew up listening to a lot. And, um, the, the more recent material, once the band started changing, um, and it changed a couple of times, the songs 
seemingly became much less of that sort of a thing and they became pretty focused to a point where there was a lot of stuff that didn't really take a lot of thought to... I think we were, we, once you get to a certain point, we were being hammered very heavily, especially after You Can't Love You, to come up with hit singles. Mm -hmm. And again, that's still the name of the game. And record companies, yeah. Yeah, and anthems. Right. I mean, My Town, which is a song that most people know, was written because the record company was hammering it and we needed an anthem. Anthem, you know, something big, easy, simple that, anybody, that everybody can everybody relate, can relate to. to, and that's how my town came about. And if you listen to my town, it doesn't say anything about the big one, it doesn't say anything about high, it doesn't say anything. Mm -hmm. it, it's very generic, right? And uh, it works on that level, yeah. but at the same time, it's not necessarily the, the song that I would want to do the run for, you know. And I know if you can't love you, it's not the song that Kevin would want to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kevin has written some of his, Kevin Raleigh has written some of his just incredible songs that I'd give my you know, right arm to have written, you know, and, and they weren't the ones that necessarily were the big hits. Mm -hmm. and the same with me. I mean, uh, stuff that I liked the best was not necessarily stuff that anybody even played on the radio. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a, you know, it's a dual-edged sword. I think amidst all the things, there's some really good stuff, but we were... Also, we were pretty eclectic and weren't real focused. Mm -hmm. Now, that was one thing I was going to mention. Did you consider that like more toward the beginning or more toward just like everything in general being? Well, and how did you mean eclectic when you said that? I grew up with I grew up with you know Beatle albums and Rolling Stones albums and, and uh, things like that, where you know where you had Norwegian wood next to uh, you know something that was was heavy, mm -hmm. you know and. So, and then yesterday, next to you know Andrew Burke and Sing or whatever, mm -hmm. and help next to something else. Where you know, I mean, you can't make a whole album that sounds like I Am the Walrus. Right. I mean, what's on that album? Penny Lane's on that album, right? Mm -hmm. Penny Lane and I Am the Walrus. Way. Yeah, I mean, that's about as far apart as you can get. Sure. But it, but it was like, okay, this is cool. These guys are doing a couple singers, different stuff. It's just, I like this track. I like this track. I don't like this track. I like this track. Thing of taking it for what it what it was and instead of having a and I don't I'm not maligning them because they were real good to us all over the years but like a foreigner album where everything's pretty straight ahead mm -hmm. so I was always of, of, of the feeling that uh, you just took the best tunes that, or the ones you liked the best when you were ready to make an album and put them on there and okay if they're you know you try to keep some balance between so they weren't all rockers or they weren't all ballads or this or that but hoping that people would be able to accept that but radio changed so much in the middle of our career that that was uh, that, that turned into a drawback mm -hmm. and everybody wanted something that they didn't have to think about and was like yeah or time. something that, would, that they immediately knew it was us right which do you which do you prefer writing ballads or rockers because you got some really great both of them I think I prefer writing ballads um, some of the rockers definitely I mean it, it's easy to write you know, it's easy to write a, a Chuck Berry knockoff. Um, if you want to just do something like that, but if you take something like uh, in the Heartland or some of those things that are they're off from Midwest that are different, they're not you know, stock necessarily, you know, form, formula type thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I get, it would depend on the mood. Some days I couldn't write a ballad if you gave me a million dollars. I could only write rockers. And other days I couldn't write something up if I had to. Mm -hmm. you know, most of my songs are pretty depressing, so. <laughs> It's basically ballads come easier that way. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess depressing that, rockers are not. They're, they're who not, wants a depressing not rock? Yeah. You know? <laughs> now you're still writing. Yeah, yeah, not as much as I'd like, but I still am. And I find myself going much more back to where I started writing the acoustic things. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like everybody is doing that. All these bands that have like come back and started releasing new albums and stuff. Everybody seems to be going back to their old formulas again. And I like that. I like that a lot because that's the stuff that everybody like first got known for. And then like the, that, that whole corporate rock attitude of the late 70s, early to mid 80s seems to be like just flying out the window and everything. Everybody's going back to that old style of, of things. Well, you know, you got to, you, I always said you got you to gotta do what, what gets you off. Uh -huh. When you start thinking too much about what the public wants, you know. Everybody suffers. You're, yeah. And, you know, and, and the record companies are really into, you know, Madonna happened, so everybody signed know, somebody that wore a bra outside their, their blouse, you know, uh -huh. and, uh, you know, white snake happens, so everybody signed somebody who looked like David Coverdale, you know, and, and uh, 
if you're if you're trying to follow trends, you're going to be six months behind. Because mm -hmm. it's not a real immediate business. Sure. You could and, make, as, and as soon as you get adjusted to a trend, it changes. Yeah. By the time your record comes out, you just sound like old old news. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, it's that's. I mean, remember when we were with Arista and the disco thing happened, right? Clive Davis came. And he says you got to put a disco trip to cut on your album. The album I think at the time was uh, the Greatest Hints, which was my Phil Spector period, anything but disco, you know. <laughs> and uh, I said, "Well, I'm not going to do a disco thing. I hate that stuff." And he said, "Well, hey, you know, Rod Stewart's doing it. The Stones are doing it." Uh, I said, "Well, that's cool, but those songs lend themselves. You know, I Miss You was a cool song. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, even Do You Think I'm Sexy was a cool song in its own right. You know, but I said I don't have anything that lends itself to that. You know." am I going to take and, you know, put, uh, put, you know, the disco thing in any song, it's just not going to work. So, consequently, he didn't do anything for the album. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, like, you got, the, you got the Midwest sound, you know, I mean, it's just, yeah, you can get the ballads and stuff, but basically it's rock and roll, you right. know, and it's, you know, it also not growing up in what you can call it, consider a cosmopolitan environment in Cleveland either, as much as you would, like, maybe in London or New York City or mm -hmm. something, Los Angeles, things like that, where you've got the the sort of influences that lend themselves to those those sorts of songs. A um, couple more things and I'll let you go so you can get ready to go up on stage there. Uh, you've done a lot of civic kind of things. You've got a lot of civic pride, which is something that I definitely like to see from someone in your stature. Um, one of the most important things that comes to mind is the Amy benefit that we covered um, last November. That was really fun. That was a, uh, I'm, you know, I'm sorry that that wasn't more successful on a financial level for the people. They put a lot of work into Emily Coleman and the people, and um, it, it, was, it was a good time. I, I, you know, it had the sort of the makings of one of those old little rascal things. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's get together and put on a show. Okay. All these adults playing kids. Yeah, you know, you bring the sheet from the curtain and we'll do the whole thing. But uh, I don't know. I've always felt. I mean, I've I've taken a lot out of this city. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of of uh, you know anything from adulation to uh, to a monetary thing and. and I feel you got to put back into it something, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, this, the city kept us alive when we were starving and just boosted us to another level when we were successful. And, uh, it's been my home, as it was for most of the guys in the band, their whole lives. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's really great. Like the Desert Storm Parade that you did, you know, yeah. which the coverage on that was just was phenomenal. It's one of the yeah, best coverages is. I've seen. Yeah, yeah, those things are cool. And, and it's, uh, for any of us that have lived here forever, you know, we've, you know, when we grew up, it was just the place we lived. You know, we didn't know any different. We'd never been anyplace else. Mm -hmm. And then we got to know it. And, and then Cleveland went through. Cleveland went through the dark ages. You know, I mean, when the, the fault and all the, the river burning and you know, everything that could possibly go wrong with the city went wrong. And it was like you know, people were leaving in droves and, and all that. So to stick around and see it start to move back the other way. You know, even if even if, if it's things as superficial as the flats and. This and that. Uh, I mean, that's all well and good, but that, you know, it'd be nice to see the public school system turn around, mm -hmm. know, as opposed to getting a new bar in the flats. Right. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I have certain certain things which I'll I'll go do any at the drop of a hat. I'll go back it up. You know, and, and other things. Uh, the other thing, when you're in the public eye, I mean, I could do charity things, you know, all day. Mm -hmm. You know, become Jerry Lewis or something. Well, there's another thing, too, to do them, you know, like, because you're in the public eye, there's another thing to do them because you want to do them, because yeah. you believe in doing them, like you obviously show that you do. Well, it, it's the thing, too. I mean, it's like, um, I've been trying to do a lot of things for uh, MS lately, just because in the last three or four years, uh, some people that I, I love dearly have come down with that disease. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, something I was aware of before, but it just didn't. Right. Yeah, it wasn't that, a personal. Yeah. Comment. So now it's more like a personal thing. So that's like a thing. But uh, you know, um, <laughs> anything that uh, it just it just depends on the moment. You know? I mean, but I, I really think that anybody, whether they're on TV or radio, or whether it's just you know John Q. Public, you've got to put something back into it, whether it's just in your neighborhood or in the city or in your you know on your block or whatever. You, it's, you know, there's a there's a, there's a civic obligation here that not enough people. Uh, now, occasionally you have to go like, hold on, I can't do this. I have, I do have to have some life of my own. And I have to do this today. 
you know, which is, and then it's really weird because sometimes people get really indignant about it. Oh yeah, I know. Once you like, once you've lent yourself to that, you know, then yeah. people think that you're that can call. Well, you did this charity. Why won't you do this charity? Yeah. And I said, well, because well, for whatever reason, whether it's scheduling or you know, maybe I don't believe in your organization, but I believe in this one. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, all right. So take a take a little bit away from that. Um, actually, take it a lot away from that. Now you um, hold a record in this place, mm -hmm. as well as over at the Coliseum, which is too far away. Um, Never be broken. Yeah. Thanks to the fire marshal. <laughs> how do you, how do you <laughs> feel about that? What a great thing. I mean, it's you know, I mean, honestly, really, truly feel about knowing that you have put the most people in this place. It's a great feeling. I mean, it's not something I wake up every morning and go, oh. <laughs> the record of Blossom. Okay. Um, you know, it comes up in conversation or it comes up in this and that. Or it, sometimes it's really funny because you'll come out to a, here to a show to see somebody else and, and you'll be with somebody. They'll have no idea you know, that that happens. You know, like, and it, someone will bring it up. And, you know, it, it, in a way, it's almost embarrassing. It's like, yeah, yeah, we'll we hold the record. <laughs> we were big ones. You know, <laughs> that type of thing. It's a good feeling because, um, I mean, we always said for whatever success we had in the time period, if we had to have success in one place, you know, to have one place be the most successful, your hometown would be the place you would want to do it. Certainly. It doesn't always happen that way for bands, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, like, look at the bands like uh, the Raspberries or something, you know, I mean, they had a lot of, you know, top ten records and singles that everybody in the world knows, and, you know, they couldn't sell out music hall and sure. Other bands I can... You know, and that was just a thing of, I don't know what, what it was. I mean, we were, you know, we kind of, we kind of caught a, caught a, caught a wave there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was great. But, it, yeah, I remember the first time we hit the stage, my dad asked me, he said, uh, I it like to be up there with all those people, you know, with the lighters in the air and all this and all that. And I said, you know, it's really weird because I don't pay much attention to it because I'm involved, I'm working. Right. And I'm looking around to see if we're ready to do the next song or, if, you know, somebody's, you know, guitar broke or this or that. And I said, you know, I don't I don't stop and take it in very often, which is kind of stupid because it's not going to be there, mm -hmm. you know. So I remember one time we went out to Coliseum, we were sold it out, and we, my job you know, as leader and front man, this was when we hit the stage to make sure everybody's ready, everybody's cool, and to count off the song, go. And that was my ma that's my main thing right to start. And I remember get, doing that, and I'm going through my whole thing, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? And I just got ready to count the song. I'm Gary Markaski, who was the guitar player at the time. He, put his, he says, hold it. He says, hold it. He says, just stop for a minute and turn around and dig this. You know? And they were, everybody was on their feet with lighters right from the start. And, said, and it was, it kind of, when I did that and actually took it in, it kind of scared me. <laughs> it's kind of like, ooh, this is, ooh, I better go back to work here, you know? Yeah, it's nice to disassociate yourself. I mean, I get that too a lot of times. Like this interview, you know, um, when I go back to watch this interview, it'll sink in a lot more than, you know, like when you're sitting here doing it because of that very thing, the working thing, and, you know, and thinking mm -hmm. of the conversation and all that sure. other stuff, which I'm sure you understand too because doing the same thing with the crew of the night thing. Um, you know, it's just really interesting. When I videotape a show, you know, it's like I've got my concentration more on what I'm doing than what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. And then when I go back and I watch it, wow, that was cool. And and that's, that's a really nice feeling to be able to suddenly take note or notice of whatever it is that you are doing like that and, and in your position here I mean just knowing that you're going out there and you're pleasing that many people has just got to be a rush. Well it's before the show so hopefully we'll please them. It's not, I, a, it's I'm, not a foregone conclusion. I'm, I'm sure that you will. Last night I, I um, was over at the Coliseum for the, the Clash of the Titans tour and Anthrax um, came up and um, were just so totally flabbergasted at the crowd response that they got this time because they were just here recently and the crowd was asleep and they were so surprised at everybody was singing along for almost every song and they just had smiles from here to here and I mean they were just well it's you know it's a what it's a nice thing about performing live is you you know as opposed to doing TV or doing uh, something else you, you, you get immediate feedback mm -hmm. I mean when you leave that stage you know whether you were appreciated or hated. Right. And as I was saying to a friend of mine that went with me last night, um, when the audience responds to you that way, of course, that pumps up your adrenaline more, and that gives you that much more energy to go back and give them more, and it's just, it's this big circle that just keeps building and building until the end of the show, you sit back and you're just breathless. And just, wow. 
and, and unfortunately, I've not seen too many shows like that, and you seem to be able to, to pretty much bring out that kind of response in the show. It's really a nice Sometimes thing. when we get lucky. The thing, the thing, our fans are getting so old now, they just can't get up anymore. There is that, too. Yes, they have been around for, for quite some there time. There goes the walkers coming in here. <laughs> um, and, and then to wrap that up, that brings me to what I was going to ask you. What, do you. what kind of a buzz do you get about tonight's show? What expectation do you have for tonight's show, After especially after having been away for so long? Yeah, it's real weird. I, I kind of thought when the show was announced and we got together, I kind of thought it would either do real well as far as selling tickets, it would either do real well or it would just do terribly. Mm -hmm. I didn't think there would be any middle ground. I thought people would either be, okay, we really want to do this again, or we just don't care about this. Anymore. And luckily it's gone towards the other, the good side. Um, who's out there and what they expect and uh, what we deliver are all to be seen in the next uh, hour or so. But um, so I haven't been on stage with some of these guys since 1977. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and the earliest version of the band has not played together since 1977. That's 14 years. Mm -hmm. a, lot of ha a lot has happened to everybody in 14 oh, years. Sure. And it was really, it's the rehearsals, which we haven't rehearsed too much because everybody's spread out all over the place. and They've been pretty intense. But it was just really good to look around. And, and I think with a, a little distance, you know, um, you pretty much remember the good stuff. And most of the, our stuff was good, I mean, in terms of all the people and the, our, our adventures and all that. Uh, you know, I mean, it was like anything. When you put that many people together for that long, there are conflicts, there are fights, there are, it's, it's like a family. Oh, yeah. But now it's more like, okay, we knew that. And we've all grown up a little, and, uh, you know, uh, all the egos are a little more in perspective. And we're all a little bit older, actually, we're a lot older. and. Uh, well, 15 years will do that to you. I don't care how old you are. No, it's real, it's real serious when the young guy in the band is like 39 now, you know, or something. So, uh, but it, I think basically, I wouldn't have done it, I wouldn't have done this just for the money. Mm -hmm. I would have only done it if I thought I, I could have fun in it. And mm -hmm. The other guys would have fun. So, um, it may be a little loose tonight. It may be real tight. I don't know. I won't know till we hit it, you know. I don't know how everybody, some of these guys have not played in this situation for a long time. And, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a good time. I understand Kevin's doing some stuff out on the West Coast these days, or out that direction. Yeah, Kevin's real busy. He had a real good album on Atlantic about a year ago, which Atlantic kind of lost for him, you know, in, in typical record company fashion. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it, you play with people who uh, talent you respect. And, and, it was funny doing sound checks and stuff. Uh, we all sort of fell back into certain little jokes and things and bits that used to come up every day, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years ago, eight years ago. And I hadn't even thought about some of these things since mm -hmm. then. And that was the stuff that, I always said I had more fun being in a rock and roll band. I had more fun in the bus than I did on the stage. Right. That's, well, on the stage you're working, on the bus you know. Yeah, I, that's, that's the stuff I remember. Right. It's the one-on-one -on -one with the people and the, and the people we were with. And, and I remember the certain shows, and I wanted to forget other shows, and this and that. But uh, it, that's what it was all about. That's why we stayed together so long, because we got, basically got along and respected each other and had a good time. And luckily, somebody paid us for it. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> and finally, what's your greatest memory as the Michael Stanley band? As the Michael Stanley band, I have two, I would think. Well, just to reach out for two. Um, I think the four nights here, four sold out nights in a row at Blossom. I mean, that was just that was just way over the top. You know, that just sort of, I still don't think of that as being totally real. That was a real milestone. And I think the last shows at the front row, the last shows we did, we did 13 shows at the front row. And I think those could have been very maudlin and very, you know, everybody sort of pissed off and press and all this. But I think that anybody that came to those 13 shows saw MSB as good as it ever was. I think those were our best shows. You know, I mean, in other words, we went out at the top of our game. Mm -hmm. You know, if you came to the last shows, you saw it the way I would like people to remember it. It's the law of the stage, leave them laughing. So it was, you know, there's a lot of them, a lot of memories. But I think those two probably stand out the most. Michael Stanley. Good to see you. Cleveland's hero, a favorite son, and I'm going to be a favorite grandfather's son. <laughs>
<laughs> and a humble person. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Pleasure.